Kia ora koutou katoa. Thank you for listening in to my talk today. I just want to begin by stating that this grows out of my long-standing interest in the right-wing populist and liberal political antagonism that I have explored through the tools of Lacanian Marxist critical theory, historical materialism, all of these sort of approaches to understanding a political, economic, kind of historical moment. And I am want to make the case vigorously here that we need to think of this quote unquote new threat of, of disinformation through those tools. And I see them by and large abandoned in what is called disinformation studies. I would think of myself uh, as fitting in, in, in with what uh, Alice Merwick et al. called critical disinformation studies and its historical lineage to propaganda studies. You know, there's nothing much new under the sun here is kind of my little provocation. And I want to also look at what are the libidinal investments that are associated with this new field of expertise, disinformation studies. So that's my talk, the Lacanian subject of cyber war between the disinfo hysteric and QAnon pervert. This is coming out of um, a paper, um, which I hope to have out this year. I'd be glad to share it with you. I'm not going to get into as much about QAnon as I would like to, um, but it's, it's best, I suppose, to investigate our side, if you will. Um, now, I want to begin by stating this is an American crisis, right? The American hegemony of the Internet has led to a kind of universalization of this framework of the problem of, of fake news and disinformation. And that is because we are, you know, we're dealing with a crisis of, of, of neoliberalism, but also of the digital teleologies of the story of the Internet, which has been so central to American soft power and hegemony in this crucial space of the global economy, right? So this is the digital teleology of, of openness and connectivity and a fantasy of univocal communication by bringing the world together. Armand Matlar is the great historian of, of communication who's, who's talked about how at you know, different historical epochs that fantasy has pervaded, right? But it's pervaded to mask the struggle to control the world. Um, and with this failure, you know, we're seeing a kind of a return to Cold War uh, language, but also the sort of material reality of, of the Internet as this tool f of information for, for warfare, for counterinsurgency, for capitalism and command and control, right? That's the sort of re-territorialization of the Internet that is happening. Another thing that's worth stating here in the sort of the particular American ideological investment here is, is Eric Davis writes brilliantly about this how basically frontier Protestantism and new religiosity and you know so new spiritual movements are forms of of, of Gnosticism of tech mediated Gnosticism so technosis is what he calls it and the fantasy of the individual technological sublime I mean that is American, the American frontier provokes fantasies of, of space and of individual transcendent and becoming as a god. That's part of the promise of the story. We'll look at that in a second. But as one becomes a god, the sort of the horror and the demonic are also sort of wedded here. Um, and that's the phase that we're in. We are in this moment where Barack Obama, right, the, the candidate who talked of his campaign as being a quote wiki campaign and born and bred of the internet now describes it as the greatest threat to democracy Shoshana Zuboff the you know liberal conscious of, of kind of the American intelligentsia describes events like January 6th as a form of epistemic terrorism that our reality has been torn from out and underneath us you see the sort of iconography here of the dark digital eye I will return to some of this iconography in a minute um, but also, you know, in Hillary Clinton, for her, January 6th were, were hordes, were the hordes of unreality, the sort of zombie, mind meld, non-human entities storming the Capitol at the whims of Putin sitting halfway across the world, 
puppeteering the collapse of America. This may sound like overwrought rhetoric, but it is commonplace in American discourse. And it is something that, again, the critical disinfo field needs to think about, right? That how much this popular narrative rests on the myth of epistemic consensus of a time where whatever facts were facts and reality was reality, right? And, and how much that myth perpetuates histories of anti-blackness, histories of anti-communist hysteria, Cold War. So let us uh, delve into some Lacanian categories and principles. This is gonna be a real, real quick hit. Principle sort of problematic of, of language for Lacan is you know how do we deal with the uncertainty in ourselves, the traumas of language, the failures of symbolization, the failure to find ourselves and the other through language. And for Lacan, right, we mediate this through through fantasy, through attachment to objectified relations, through the symbolic order. That is the way in which we navigate this potential trauma that it's bubbling, that's brewing beneath the surface, which he calls the real, right? The real is is when it's sort of mask off. You must confront the sort of that sort of trauma, that failure, that gap in yourself and your sense of uh, where you are in the world and how that is represented and mediated to you, right? That's the sort of fundamental problematic of Lacan and language. Now, um, Andre Neselder talks about the internet as you know as a particular symbolic order as a particular way of mediating this trauma as creating the interface fantasy that we might finally achieve a kind of symbolization of of the world and all of its complexity as it really is as it really exists and this is again a fantasy that whether we're talking about cybernetics or Chomsky's universal grammar, right? This is something that has animated um, our understanding of what the digital and network communication can reveal. And again, back to Eric Davis, it is something that would make us as a god, right? That would give us this over divine overview effect. This is something that the whole Earth catalog hippies talked about, right? That is the sort of fundamental fantasy here primarily through the, 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 the methods, the tools of, of sort of a big data positivism, something that might overcome the Lacanian lack and manage the world through data. It is also something that promotes technocratic fantasies of, of domination, of object relations, of imbuing the computer and data with, with a particular power and efficacy where, where politics would otherwise fail us. Now we are in the moment of, uh, you know, now is the time of techno monsters, essentially. And, and the reason here is, again, the sort of this, this profound failure of, of 2016, of QAnon, of January 6th, all of these things that um, underscore the way in which we are caught up in the gears of, of global capitalism and caught up in the gears of, of cyber war as essential to contemporary capitalism, right? So we experience network communication as this trauma of, of being influenced, manipulated, propagandized, and sold to by myriad forces, the real meaning of which is occulted from us. Just as an aside, I mean, that, that's why people freak out about 5G towers. But Zizek has a great sort of formulation of how the failures of these fantasies of the kind of weightless economy and digital teleologies return to produce the horror of the real. And that's what my, my article and, and what I've sort of argued here is that Techno horror is back as a kind of symbolization of, of this sort of confrontation of the real, but also of an enemy that is demonic. Zizek talks that in a, in a supposed like frictionless, seamless, data-driven economy, those frictions exist, but they become invisible. They are forced into the netherworld outside of our postmodern, post-industrial universe. And frankly, you know, we we fail to have the right sort of language for 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 grand theories of this as well. So that is why for him this frictionless universe of digitized communication is constantly haunted by the notion of global catastrophe lurking around the corner 
threatening to explode at any moment. It's that, you know, return of the material real. And I've uh, got a little image there from, from the great techno horror Pulse, um, which, uh, you know, the, the very sort of like techno-mediated, alienated communication becomes a sort of precipitating uh, event for like actual like extinction level catastrophe. So it's a wonderful sort of prescient film for, for capturing um, the current techno malaise. And in, and in fact, you know, um, as Nuselder talks about it, the very fantasy of for omnipotent control is also sort of marked by the inverse, right? That there is a, a fear that we are being manipulated, attacked, um, just as we would, in a sense, want to ourselves, right? So there's a sort of perverse side to, to this fantasy. Therefore, you know, cyber war, uh, you know, we could define it as, as these, these characteristics of subterfuge, anonymity, subjective fragmentation, asymmetry. It provokes the hysterics outburst, right? And it's better to be a hysteric than a pervert. But it, this outburst of, of who am I to the other, what does the other want from me? Um, and as Melanthe puts it, cyber war turns the fog of war onto the battleground that is subjectivity. Right and on to all of the sorts of traumas and anxieties of, of subjectivity that the, the kind of Lacanian problematic is, is dealing with. So, so where are we in sort of this current moment where the political struggle between liberalism and populism takes the form of the hysteric and the pervert in cyber war? Well, you know, the hysteric is, is, is a demand for impossible eternal vigilance of of the state of the citizenry against an other of of social jouissance that loves to collapse our society that loves to turn us inside out who like a chaos demon feasts on our, our malaise and like this is not far this is not actually um a far step from how you know putin is talked about it is also a way of reducing the geopolitical sort of struggle and the sort of historical conjuncture to the realm of signs and in which a, you know, the expert discerns how this ambient malaise and malevolence is permeating language, memes, and network infrastructure. And I can give you a million examples of so-called smart disinfo experts just like responding to a random Russian Twitter account as if they'd seen the Ring video. As Thacker puts it, this is a horror. It's the horror of the real, not in metaphorical terms. It really is how this is experienced for the disinfo hysteric. So Putin really is, quote, the evil demiurge, the great tyrant Yaltabath, the son of chaos. And as Fareed Zakaria puts it, right, Russia has hacked America's computer systems and our minds as well, right? There's just a, a remote push button controlling of, of the national will. There's a vital distinction here. Again, better to be a hysteric than a pervert. This distinction is mediated between uh, a proximity to jouissance. The expertise developed by the disinfo warrior is a kind of means to like study this horrific other in the, in the quest for sort of reclaiming truth and the symbolic order, whereas the QAnon digital soldier is fully apocalyptically invested in this enjoyment, and it is a bloodthirsty enjoyment, right? Uh, Q is, is fully identified with the sort of repressed, obscene underside of the law, and that is why military tribunals and coups and, and General Flynn become such important sort of ways of thinking about this, but then also turning their banal media consumption into forms of like information warfare. It's fully identified with this kind of material reality of cyber war. Which brings us to some examples here. I, you know, I've taken a few sort of canonical examples from this paradigm that are part of my study. I would just, you know, also working on something about the disinformation um, discipline as a kind of a, 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 a field phenomenon, right? To use the 
the language of Bourdieu. The key thing for now is, and something to retain here going forward, is, is just thinking about how closely aligned much of this academic and journalistic work is to, if not explicitly, then indirectly, to things like the Atlantic Council, the National Endowment for Democracy, Brookings Institute, all these you know, traditional players in the American national security blob. So I've, uh, one of the really important papers that was seminal to sort of developing and theorizing the Russian disinformation menace is, is Pomerantsov and Michael Weiss's The Menace of Unreality, which reads like a pulpy Lovecraftian tale about the snap of the fingers uh, Putin and his technologists are able to make our world unreal. Reality becomes upside down and reinvented. Minds are muddled. The West is turned in on itself. Societies are manipulated from the inside by the postmodern international, which is a kind of overdetermined network of both the far right and the far left. So Bernie Sanders is also in league with the sort of nonlinear postmodern international, which again, it has this great ring of, of sort of Kremlinologist sort of terms to it. And it's, you know, it's worth stating how things like Black Lives Matter protests have been singled out by Susan Rice or Kamala Harris. You know, both have talked about the Russian hand in fomenting these really important progressive social movements. The other one I, I want to highlight is the new knowledge report to the Senate Intelligence Committee on meme warfare, which they purport demonstrates a very nuanced and deep knowledge of American culture. And as evidence, they use the Jesus masturbation memes and describe this despite having no evidence, as a timeless espionage practice of recruiting an asset by exploiting a personal vulnerability to blackmail and manipulate these individuals in the future. So the comedic double entendre, struggling with addiction to masturbation, reach out to me and we'll beat it together, Jesus. That's, that's a sexual espionage play. You know, the, it's pretty unserious stuff, but it plays with the sort of fun of identifying the, the jouissance of this perfidious other. It also veers very closely to the enjoyment of expertise um, and the desire to become a new master, right? So the head of new knowledge has put herself forward in the New York Times as a candidate to be a, a cabinet minister for the Biden administration as the quote, realities are, which is, um, I guess, quite a grandiose title. But again, isn't it fascinating how it has a Russian, um, a Russian title? It's like you desire to be the Russian. That's what's at, that's what's at work here. And, and to be very explicit about it, new knowledge in 2017 was busted for running a so-called Russian false flag disinfo campaign in a Republican Senate by-election. That was them. They did that, right? To to study the enemy, you must become the enemy. Now, I want to play you perhaps maybe, you know, one of the most overwrought examples of this. And this is a, um, a New York Times documentary called Operation Infection. The thing about a virus is it doesn't destroy you head on. Instead, it brings you down from the inside turning your own cells into enemies. This story is about a virus, a virus created five decades ago by a government to slowly and methodically poison its enemies. But it's not a biological virus, it's uh, more like a political one, and chances are you've already been infected. If you feel like you don't know who to trust anymore, this might be the thing that's making you feel that way. If you feel exhausted by the news, this could be why. And if you're sick of it all and you just want to stop caring, then we really need to talk. Ready? So I'm going to go ahead and say it. I do not think fake news is a virus. I do not think this is a particularly useful way of thinking about the, the current moment. It is one steeped in the sort of hysterical notion of a timeless Soviet evil that was hatched hundreds of years ago to tear us apart from the insides. But it's also a, a narrative that really only secures the enjoyment and pleasure 
of the hysteric disinfo expert in the face of the political real. It does not get us any closer to understanding the kind of historical materialist forces that are at play in something like QAnon or the surging populist right. Of course, techno and horror tropes have been part of sort of broader technological moments and social upheavals, but this is, is not going to cut it. And, and this doesn't get us any closer to understanding where these movements have come from and what political forces allow them to continue to grow and flourish. Thank you for listening.